am a senior policy officer um, at the Information Commissioner's Office and um, because usually um, people aren't exactly 100% sure what we do and, and, and how we do it, I thought I'd probably start off by, by telling you um, a little bit about, about, about us. Um, we are the UK's independent body set up to uphold information rights. Um, we enforce and regulate the Data Protection Act and other information rights legislation such as the Freedom of Information Act but of course today I'm here with my data protection um, hat on. And um, as well as the enforcement and regulatory role, we do provide advice and information as well. We do things like I'm doing today. We meet with major stakeholders to try and encourage good information rights practice. And we have an audit um, element to the organisation as well, um, who go out and do data protection audits um, to, um, uh, to assist data controllers in their responsibilities. So. Um, the Data Protection Act, um, as it is today, um, 1998, piece of legislation, and um, these are the principles. You may well be quite familiar with them, um, but just a very, very quick synopsis, um, just so, so you know where, where we're coming from. Um, first of all, the Data Protection Act applies when you process personal data. Personal data being um, data that identifies a living individual. So data that doesn't identify anyone, data that's properly, fully anonymised, is not covered by the Data Protection Act. And of course, data about people who've died also not covered by the Data Protection Act. So identifiable living individuals is, is, is what we're interested in. As well as, as, as that definition, it's probably worth mentioning the, the, the definition of data controller. Um, that is the organisation, usually, but it can be an individual, um, who is um, uh, controlling the manner and the purpose of, of, of the processing of personal data. And it is the data controller that the law applies to. So usually it, it, it's the organisation. So um, if you're um, a data controller and you process personal data, you need to comply with those principles there, um, the eight data protection principles. Um, and I'll, I'll run through um, seven of them incredibly quickly because I'm really here to talk to you today about security. So the first one, um, personal information must be fairly and lawfully processed. Uh, number two, must be processed for limited and specified purposes. That is, you can't just process anything about anybody. It's, you've got to have a good legal reason for doing it. And it's got to be limited to the purposes for which <clears throat> you're processing it. Three, four and five are your data quality, data integrity um, type principles. That um, the personal data that you process about people must be adequate, relevant and not excessive. So that is, you must have enough information for what you need, but not too much. It must be accurate and it must be up to date and it must not be kept for longer than is necessary so you need to have a retention period in place. Um, number six, that you must process personal data in line with um, people's individual rights so that means you must comply with subject access requests for example um, or um, pro in, in some situations you must um, comply with people's requests to stop processing their personal data although that is a fairly um, limited situation where that can apply. Um, number eight, I'll miss seven out for now, um, is about personal data not being, um, shouldn't be transferred outside of the European economic area without adequate protection. So it doesn't mean you can't do it, but means you must have adequate protection in place. And I will be touching on that one a little bit later. Um, and personal data must be secure, number seven. That's the one I'm going to be really talking about today. Um, why am I going to be talking about that one today? Well because it's one where a lot of our enforcement action has taken place and um, I'll be giving you a little bit of breaking news later about um, some new enforcement action that has, has been made public today. Um, but our maximum fine that we can issue to data controllers is currently £500,000. Um, so fairly painful for, for, for your average data controller. Um, that's probably, that's at the moment the, the largest tool in our box, if you like. Um, we have lots of other enforcement, um, um, enforcement tools available, such as undertakings, enforcement notices, that sort of thing. But for the most serious data breaches, where policies and procedures really weren't kept to and, and the risk was very high to individuals, possibly causing harm and distress, um, and where data controllers really should have done better, that's the worst that can happen at the moment. So as I said, data security is, is a really important element of the Data Protection Act. So it's probably worth going into now what the actual requirement is under the law. What do you actually have to do from the a point of um, 
uh, security. It's worth looking at the, the text of the seventh principle. The seventh principle of the Data Protection Act states that appropriate measures, te both technical and organisational, must be taken against unauthorised or unlawful processing of personal data and against accidental loss or destruction of or damage to personal data. So quite right, wide ranging actually and probably the key points to take away from that is um, first of all the appropriate term. Um, so you need to think about what is appropriate and appropriate really needs to consider the risk to the data so again, it's about what harm and distress could, um, could, could be suffered by individuals if a, a breach were to take place. Um, and um, uh, obviously volume sometimes is relevant too. So, so it, you know, if, if, if you're processing a lot of personal data, um, that's another consideration as to how much um, consideration you must give to security. So what is appropriate is, 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 is how much you should do under the Act. Another thing worth taking away from this is the split between technical and organisational measures. Um, that means that it's not good enough just to do technical things, it's not good enough just to do organisational things, you must do both. What sort of things are we talking about here? Technical measures are things like IT security, like firewalls, like antivirus, um, like encryption, like having good backups in place, like making sure software is updated. Um, so it's all about having your, your IT security um, proper and, and in place. Organisational, for the purposes of the Data Protection Act, is just as important. So organisational measures like policies and procedures, um, access controls and, and policies on who can access what, um, policies on how data can be transferred, whether data can be, can be taken out of the organisation in terms of um, physically or in terms of home working policies, that sort of thing. Um, all of those things are really, really important for, for, for having a, a good whole policy on, on, on um, data security. And all of that is really underpinned by training. And if you were to look through a lot of our, the action that we've taken on Principle 7, you'd be hard pressed to find training not mentioned in, in any of our civil monetary penalties or undertakings or enforcement notices where, where security has been an issue. So staff awareness and staff training is really, really important as far as, as, far as we're concerned. So that's the law, that, that's what you need to do. It's probably worth looking now um, at what sort of things do we see as an office. Um, and I don't know how well you can see that, but obviously the, the slides can and, and, and will be shared with you. Um, but data security trends that we see in our office, um, we post on our website on a quarterly basis. Um, and these were the figures for April to June um, 2016, so the, the, the most recent quarter that we've got figures for at the moment. And as you can see, a lot of it is simple stuff. It's actually the top one, data posted or faxed to incorrect recipients. So, so real sort of old school data breaches. Loss or theft of paperwork, another one. Data sent by email to the incorrect recipient. We see a lot, a lot of that, um, whether that's um, it, just a, an accidental send or, or use of the global address book in, a, in, in an inappropriate way, or whether it's failure to use BCC, it's simple things actually that we see most of. Um, cyber incidents are um, increasing in terms, of, in terms of what we're seeing, and, and I'll go into a, a few more details about what cyber incidents we see most um, in the next slide. But also things like failure to redact data, um, loss or theft of unencrypted devices. Um, that's one that, that, you know, as far as we're concerned, is a real no-brainer now. If you've got sensitive personal data on a mobile device, it really must be encrypted. And if it isn't, and there's a breach, we will consider taking enforcement action. So it's, it's things like that, simple things. And the cybersecurity trends that we see, 
Well, um, this is what we saw in, um, in, in that, that same quarter, so April to June 2016. Um, in total, I think there were 50 um, incidents that came to our attention, and the, the biggest was all about cybersecurity misconfiguration. So things like inadvertent publishing of data on a, on a, on a website, or um, just data being somehow made available in that website and not, not, um, not tightened up enough so that people could actually access personal data via, via website sites when they shouldn't really have been able to. Um, also things like exfiltration um, came in next. Phishing is still a really big one and, and that's fairly consistent I suppose um, with uh, reports that um, I think the UK National Computer Emergency Response Team, um, they reported fairly recently that phishing emails were the number one root cause of cyber incidents in 2015 and 2016. So again, that's fairly consistent with what we see as well. And then obviously there's all, all the others as well, um, uh, distributed denial of service attacks, they're, they're in there too. But down at the bottom, really, uh, you know, simple stuff um, all, also comes through to us as well. Cryptographic flaws, so failure to use um, secure um, HTTPS. Um, and weak levels of encryption. So, you know, a lot of the time what we see is, is quite simple mistakes being made. So that's what we see. Not all of that results in enforcement action. Some of it does. Um, and this is where um, organisations um, can come to the attention of us um, and, and our enforcement team. Now, I've got a couple to share with you, um, but before I do, um, it's worth mentioning that, that in the last hour, um, it's been reported, um, we've, um, we've finally been allowed to, to say that um, Talk Talk um, have been issued with our biggest fine ever um, by the ICO. Um, we fined them £400,000, um, and that's just been made public in the last hour or so. And that was because of um, a cyber attack. It was um, security failings that allowed a cyber attacker access to customer data um, on the website. It was really, um, and, uh, quoting from, from our information commissioner, Elizabeth Denham, it really was a, a failure to implement the most basic cyber security measures. Um, what was it? Well, it was a, a, an SQL injection. Um, it was an attack on three vulnerable web pages that existed um, in the infrastructure that was um, inherited from the um, takeover of um, Tiscali's UK operations. And quite simply, um, Talk Talk failed to scan that infrastructure properly. And so they didn't realise there were three vulnerable web pages on there, and, and obviously the, the attack happened and customer data was compromised. So, so you know, a simple mistake, um, a simple thing that really shouldn't have happened, and, and £400,000 um, was the result. Um, other things, um, that was quite a useful one obviously, it's, it's good to have a, a nice cyber um, um, incident to talk about, um, but the other ones that we've, that we've seen um, that weren't necessarily cyber events that, that, that do cause um, uh, quite a lot of interest from our office. Um, this one for example, Hampshire County Council is a fairly recent one, um, we find them £100,000 and this was a, a paper based incident. This was documents containing personal details of over a hundred people were found in a disused building. This was a building that the council was selling. Um, adults and children's services um, council departments were in the building and they were vacating. Um, they vacated the building and over the two, a two-year period um, that building was accessed by estate agents and prospective buyers. Um, when prospective buyers did actually buy the, um, the building, um, they found social care files, social care complaints, and 45 bags of confidential waste. So really simple stuff that, that should have been dealt with. And the reason why the fine was um, you know, fairly substantial was because they just simply didn't have a policy or procedure in place uh, to, to, uh, on, on how to vacate premises securely and properly. So again, simple things. They failed to take appropriate organisational measures. This one here, we've got a police force in Wales, David Powers Police, £150,000, um, and they sent an email identifying eight sex, sex offenders, um, sent it to the member of the public in error. And that was because they had this member of the public's email address, the, um, she was a member of a, a community group, so, so they had her email address, they contacted her sometimes for those sort of um, purposes. 
Um, but that email address and other members of the public's email addresses um, were put in the global address book of the police force. And so when this email, which was supposed to be sent only internally, obviously, um, th th when they went through the global address book, they hit the wrong option and it went to the, um, a lady, a member of the public. Um, and not only that, but um, they'd also sent five emails to her previously, um, with a, a, in, inappropriately as well, and she had contacted them to say, can you please stop sending me these emails? I don't think I should be receiving these, and they hadn't acted on it properly. So again, simple errors, simple things that, that, that really shouldn't, um, shouldn't happen. So, what can organisations do to prevent themselves being the next enforcement headline? Well, what we say is, is it's, it's all about making sure that you know what you've got and you know where it is and you know what you've got in place to protect it. So it's about reviewing the personal data that you collect, reviewing the personal data that you process and store, um, and, and look at what policies, procedures, um, what systems you have in place to protect that data. And one way in which um, businesses can start doing this, um, this is um, something that we have in place that's really aimed at small and medium enterprises, um, but obviously anybody can, can use it as a start. Um, we've got a, a self-assessment toolkit on our website, which is um, a, a load of questions that organisations can go through and rate themselves as to how far they think they, they comply. It's not just about security, actually, although there's quite a significant lot of security um, uh, elements on there. Um, but uh, as you can see here, there are um, things about configuration, removable media, home working policies, that sort of thing. So organisations can fill it in and they can, depending on how they've, they've got their um, system set up, they can either receive a, a PDF report or they can copy and paste a, a report into Word that gives them a, a rundown as to what things that they might perhaps need to do next to improve their security. So that from the absolute basics there to obviously some more technical guidance. Um, we're increasing the amount of technical guidance we have on our website all the time. Um, so if you don't already go on our website, you, you, you should. Um, we have um, a, a technology team now who, who do do some, some slightly more technical guidance for um, IT um, literate people as well as the, the more policy and procedure and, and, and legal stuff as well. So it's always worth looking at our website for, for new guidance. Finally, um, I want to talk about the changes um, in, in the, the landscape that we're working in. You know, that, that's the current stuff, current law, current enforcement um, situation. But um, obviously things are and, 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 and do change. And I've got a couple of things I did want to mention. One being international transfers and the second being the EU General Data Protection Regulation. First thing. Transfers to the USA. I did say I'd mention a little bit more about Principle 8, the eighth principle of the Data Protection Act. And to be reminded, the, the eighth principle requires that data controllers, if they wish to transfer personal data outside of the European economic area, must ensure there is adequate protection in place. How can they do that? Well, first of all, um, the European Commission has rated some um, countries as adequate for the purposes of international transfers. So countries like New Zealand, like Argentina, um, Andorra, I think, um, Channel Islands, a couple of the Channel Islands, there, there's a list on the Euro um, European Commission website. If you're transferring to countries that have an adequacy decision, then you're fine. Um, other ways they can, it can be done is contractual clauses. So if you have um, certain, con certain clauses in contracts, this can be enough to protect um, uh, international transferred data. In the case of the USA, and this is what we're talking about here, um, the USA is not on the adequate list, and while obviously data controllers can and do use contracts to, to transfer data um, to the USA, um, there used to be a, a different mechanism by which it could be done, and this was the safe harbour mechanism. Um, and all the safe harbour initiative was, was the, the Federal Trade Commission um, set up um, a, a, pr a program really that organisations could sign up to and if they signed up to Safe Harbour they were essentially committing to doing certain things around data protection, data security and privacy. Um, and that mechanism used to be approved by the European Union. Um, however, there was a, a, a case at the um, Court of Justice of the European Union um, uh, 
the Schrems case, which you may have heard of, um, which effectively resulted in the European Commission's adequacy ruling of the Safe Harbour programme being removed um, because of the issue with USA data um, being accessible to the, the, the government and, and the privacy implications of that. Um, so that was a bit of a problem, obviously. Um, but now they have developed a new mechanism called the Privacy Shield. And although there was a period of uncertainty after which the Safe Harbour um, initiative was, was ruled not adequate, um, um, from the 1st of August, the US EU Privacy Shield is now in place. And it's a similar kind of thing in that organisations do sign up to it. Um, so not all American companies and organizations have, have signed up, but um, they're, they're, they're increasing in number every day. Um, and it's still a sign-up scheme, but it's a stronger one. Um, there are stronger privacy um, requirements, stronger redress um, uh, procedures in place, which basically means that now if, if an organization has signed up to the Privacy Shield, um, data controllers can once again transfer data to the United States without, um, without worrying about, about whether it's adequate or not. Um, so practical implications as data controllers, what do you need to do? First of all, you need to check if you are sending any data to the USA. Secondly, you need to work out what mechanism you've been using, whether you were using Safe Harbor or whether you were using contracts. Um, if you were using Safe Harbor, you need to review that very, very quickly, because obviously that is no longer adequate, so that means the transfer is, is, is not, not adequate as it stands. And, may, and then perhaps check if the company that you're transferring to has signed up to the Privacy Shield. Um, if they have, then that's good. If they haven't, then you need to be looking at perhaps contractual mechanisms. We've got guidance on our website about it, um, but I think it's, it's, it's an area that um, any organisation that does transfer to the USA needs to be well aware of. bit of the future and, and perhaps the, the biggest and perhaps the most uncertain um, I think is um, this thing here um, the European General Data Protection Regulation now you may well be aware that um, uh, a few months ago a new EU regulation was signed and, and published in the official journal of the European Union um, that will commit all member states to comply with it from the 25th of May 2018 um, and obviously that's all fine as an EU member state. We will have to comply with that from the 25th of May 2018. Um, Brexit has caused a few, um, a few uh, bits, of, bits of confusion, I think, um, around that. Because obviously there's now a whole host of uncertainty around, well, what actually happens when we leave the EU? Well, um, there is still some uncertainty around that as to um, how far and, and, and when and... and how and, and if the UK will, will be complying with the General Data Protection Regulation. But however, what, what do we do know? Well, we do know that on the 25th of May 2018, it's fairly likely that we'll still be a member of the European Union. So organisations should still be looking at the General Data Protection Regulation and looking at how they're going to comply with it on the 21st of May 2018. Um, organisations who do business in Europe anyway will probably have to think about how they're going to keep on complying essentially with it even post-Brexit because to share data with the European Union you're going to have to be adequate and they're not going to um, be happy that, that an a country is adequate if they're not complying with the, the European standards. Um, organisations that don't share data with Europe, well again maybe a little bit of uncertainty there um, but it's fair to say that, that we have things on our website to um, s suggest that organisations should, should start thinking about um, how, how they can comply. Um, it's fair to say there is still some uncertainty. The government are going to set the agenda. The government will decide what laws we, um, we, we will be subject to post-Brexit and they will set the timetable for any future reforms of Data Protection Act. Um, but the ICO's view is that no matter what the future legal relationship is between the UK and Europe, personal information is going to have to still flow internationally and particularly between the UK and the EU. It's fundamental to, to the digital economy. And that in a global economy, we need um, consistency of law and consistency of standards. And the GDPR is a strong law, 
And once we're out of Europe, we'll still need to be deemed adequate or essentially equivalent to it. So um, it's, it's probably time to, to start looking at it if you haven't already. One thing we do say, though, is that obviously the Data Protection Act remains UK law for now, business as usual for most organisations, and quite helpfully, the GDPR does build on the Data Protection Act. There are some very, very, there's some very familiar stuff in there. Um, it does have some enhanced protections, and, and they will be relevant, um, but essentially it does build on, on the, um, the, the Data Protection Act. Um, we have put some guidance out. We've got a couple of initial pieces of guidance that would probably be really helpful to you. Um, one is our 12 steps guide, and that takes you through 12 areas which you should particularly start looking at um, early. Things like subject access requests, because they will become free as opposed to the £10 charge. Um, the time scale to, to comply with subject access requests will reduce from 40 days to a month. Consent is an area that organisations need to look at because the GDPR has a very high standard of consent. So if you're processing people's personal data on the basis of their consent, um, then you'll need to look at that. It will need to be freely given, specific, informed, and new word, unambiguous. So um, make of that um, what you will. But one area that's really new that will be very relevant for, for all data controllers is accountability. There's a new principle in there, and it's the accountability principle. And this basically means that you now, as a data controller, will have to prove that you comply with data protection legislation, which means you're going to have to document more stuff. You're going to have to be able to, to evidence and prove what policies, what processes, what procedures you have in place to make sure that you comply. So that's a really important area. Other important areas, um, data protection impact assessments, or as, as we previously um, called them in our guidance, privacy impact assessments, very similar sort of thing anyway. Um, we've always said that it's good practice when you're putting in a, 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 new, a new computer system or when you're processing some new personal data in a new way, that it's really important to do a privacy impact assessment. But until now, that's been good practice. GDPR has put that into law. So if you're doing anything that, that could, um, that has sort of privacy implications for individuals other than really low risk things, you will have to think about doing a data um, protection impact assessment, which I say is in essentially a privacy impact assessment. Um, some organisations will have to have data protection officers in place, um, that's new. Um, breach notification is also a new area. Um, currently, um, breach notification is, is well, you know, you, you notify the ICO if you think the breach is serious enough at the moment. Um, there's still an element of that, that un but the, the now it's sort of turned on its head a little bit that if the um, breach, unless the breach is very low risk, um, organisations will have to notify um, the, the Data Protection Authority um, in, in, in their country, and they'll have to notify within 72 hours or give good reasons why they couldn't. So breach notification is a, a, a new area that, that most data controllers will have to look at. Um, that also extends to notifying data subjects as well. So again, unless it's really quite a low risk breach, um, you're going to have to consider whether to notify data subjects as well in the event of suffering a data breach. In terms of general security in the General Data Protection Regulation, it's um, uh, one good thing, really, is that the principle that I took you through earlier is, is essentially still in there. It still talks about appropriate technical and organisational measures having to be in place to protect the data that you process, and it still talks about protecting against unauthorised or unlawful processing and against um, loss and, and, and damage to data as well. Um, but uh, new things in, in the GDPR, it now also gives you some examples of what those measures might be. Um, so obviously they're not exhaustive, but it talks about measures such as pseudonymization of data. Um, so anonymization, pseudonymization is, is, is an area that obviously can be considered to, to, to lessen the risk to the data that you hold. Encryption is, is specifically mentioned. Obviously, it's something we've gone on about for a long time in our guidance, and I suspect it's something that a lot of you consider on a day-to-day -day basis, but that's now sitting in, in, in the law as opposed to, to in, in, in guidance from the regulator. 
Um, and the other things that it mentions in terms of in terms of examples is that it, it essentially says you have to have the ability to ensure ongoing confidentiality and integrity, availability and resilience of your personal data. You have to have the ability to restore your personal data in terms of its availability and access to it in the event of a, a, an, an incident. And crucially, I've heard it meant I was only sat in for the, the previous um, session, but um, a lot of talk was made of, of, of testing, penetration testing. Crucially, the Act, uh, the, the regulation says that organisations must have a process in place to test and evaluate the effectiveness of their security measures. So there's a little bit more specifics in there that, that perhaps you're already doing, but it's, it's, it's worth knowing that those are, will, will now be in the law as opposed to um, uh, just, just good practice. And then the final key thing about the, the general data protection regulation, I guess, is the fines regime. Obviously, I sort of weighed at £500,000 and said, oh, that's really big, and said, you know, we've, we've just, you know, done, issued our, our biggest ever fine of £400,000. But um, those of you who may have looked at the, the, the regulation, the fines are considerably bigger than that. Um, numbers that are mentioned, um, maximum of 10 million for some breaches, um, euros by the way, and a maximum of 20 million, breach, uh, 20 million euros for, um, for, for certain other breaches. Um, or percentage of global turnover, whichever is the higher. And again, the maximum for certain types of breaches is 4% of global annual um, turnover. So very large fines on the horizon for the worst data breaches um, under the General Data Protection Regulation. So, um, as I said, we have guidance on our website about all of this. Um, if you go on to ico.org.uk, you'll find a wealth of guidance on the current law, um, of, of course. But you will also find on our DP reform microsite, you will also find practical advice and guidance um, starting to come about on, on, on the new law as well. Currently, we've got the 12 steps and we've got an overview which basically sets out the differences between uh, the two um, the two two pieces of legislation sets out where, where they differ. Um, so we, we try and, and provide advice and guidance where we can. So do go onto our website and have a look. Other ways in which we, we help, um, as I said, we, we've got the website, but we also have a helpline. So again, for any particularly sticky issues, concerns, problems, it's always worth having a look on there um, and, and, and um, phoning us up if you need to. Um, we do have sort of human beings at the end of the, the line who can, who can help you, um, at least point you to, to the right bit of guidance um, or can, can perhaps answer your questions. Um, finally, we have an e-newsletter as well. Um, so if you sign up to our e-newsletter via our website, then obviously you'll get the most recent, uh, you know, the, the hot off the press updates on new guidance and, and perhaps new approaches that we've got. Um, so there you go, really. Um, I am now open to questions.